Hey guys, it's Dan Firecatcher here with another episode of Historical Teaching. Today's episode will be about another MLB franchise, the Atlanta Braves. I hope you all enjoy, and now, let's get into this. Unlike the Diamondbacks from the last episode, the history of the Atlanta Braves is a far longer one, so I'll be more focused on key events rather than doing the year-by-year overview as I did with the Diamondbacks. The history of the Atlanta Braves starts way back in 1870 in Cincinnati, Ohio. In Cincinnati, there was a professional baseball team called the Red Stockings, who after a few years of playing, decided to dissolve after the 1870 baseball season. Due to the dissolving of the team, some people were left without a job or a hobby. After the Cincinnati Red Stockings dissolved, some players joined the newly forming Boston Red Stockings in Boston, Massachusetts at the South End Grounds, which would play in the National Association of Professional Baseball Players, which would be in action from 1871 through 75. During that period, the Red Stockings were the dynasty of the league as they won four of the five championships the league held. In 1876, the NAPBB, which is, was the league's name abbreviated, ceased and the Red Stockings joined the National League as a charter team. During this transition in leagues, the Red Stockings became commonly known as the Red Caps as the Cincinnati Red Stockings came back into existence the same year as a charter team for the National League. During the period of 1877 through 1901, the Red Caps, who became renamed as the Boston Bean Eaters, yes, what a fantastic name, in 1883 dominated the National League, winning eight pennants and also had a powerful 1898 team that went amazingly 102 and 47. This period of dominance would come crashing down in 1901, however, as the new American League introduced another team in Boston, the still standing Red Sox, who were called the Boston Americans until 1908 for a pretty trivial reason. They didn't become the Red Sox until the Bean Eaters stopped using Red Sox in their uniform. Most of the talent that the Bean Eaters had was lured away to the Americans due to the fact that the Americans offered far bigger contracts than the Bean Eaters decided to offer. The truth was, the Bean Eaters didn't even offer contracts to the players because they thought that the loyalty would have kicked in, but instead the players left and taking their talent with them. The loss of their talent hit them hard, as the period from 1900 to 1913 was a ghastly one, as they only had one winning season out of those 13 years. Also, in six of those seasons, they lost over 100 games out of the 162 they played. This also marked a period in which they were sold three times in the span of five years. The team was first sold in 1907 to George and John Dovey, who named the team after, so- after themselves as the Boston Doves. The team was then sold again in 1911 to William Hepburn Russell, who renamed the team the Boston Rustlers. The team was then sold again the year after to a group led by James Gaffney and renamed to the Boston Braves. After those years of hardship, the Braves finally had success again in 1914. They started the season pitifully slow before storming back midseason and taking the NL pennant from the New York Giants. They went into the 1914 World Series as heavy underdogs to the Philadelphia Athletics. Somehow, they ended up sweeping the A's, playing all their home games in Fenway Park, the home of the Red Sox, as their normal home, the South End Grounds, was far too small for the crowds. Due to the success in the World Series, Gaffney was inspired to build Braves Field, which the team would move into in 1915. After their World Series win and their move, their move, the team was competitive only in 1915 and 16. After 1916, the team went on a terrible period of losses, as they went from 1917 through 1932 without making the playoffs, only having two winning seasons in that period. In 1923, they were sold to Emile Fuchs, which was just about the midpoint of this terribleness. In 1933 and 1934, the team began to get a new bout of life, as they began to compete once again. In 1935, the Braves made a deal with the New York Yankees to get the one and only Babe Ruth. They succeeded gaining Ruth as a player as well as, a, as an assistant manager, vice president, and he would get a gain of the profits. Or so it seemed. The 1935 season spiraled out of control as Ruth's health began to deteriorate. Pitchers threatened striking if he was in the lineup, and he found out that Fuchs had tried to finesse him. 
lying about managing and earning profits. Due to this, Ruth retired on June 1st, 1935, leaving a team that would end at 38 and 115, the second worst in National League history. Fuchs would then be forced out of ownership of the team, and the team would become the Boston Bees from the period of 1936 through 1941. In 1941, the team would become the Boston Braves again, after Lou Perini became the owner. 1941 through 1947 would be a time of rebuilding and silence, as the team was just trying to recover from the struggle of 1935. In 1948, the Braves would storm ahead and win the NL pennant, going to the World Series to face off against the Cleveland Indians. Unfortunately, the Braves would lose in six games, marking the last success they would have in Boston. After 1948, attendance at Braves games began to dwindle as Boston baseball fans flocked to the Red Sox, securing them as Boston's top team. 1952 would be the last season in Boston as they would barely muster 282,000 fans at home games throughout the entire season. March 13, 1953 was the day that Lou Perini asked the National League if he could move the Braves to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This date became known as Black Friday to the devoted fans who voiced their dismay but the dwindling attendance forced Perini's hand. During spring training in 1953, the relocation was made final, and the Braves moved to Milwaukee, relocating their AAA affiliate, the Brewers, an MLB team now, to Toledo, Ohio. Braves Field would meanwhile be sold to Boston University after the move. This marked the first relocation of a major league team in MLB history. The city of Milwaukee went insane over the Braves, accepting them into the city happily. The inaugural 1953 season ended 92-62, starting with what many hoped would be a successful tenure in the city. The season's success of 1953 also drew a then-record 1.8 million home fans to home games. Seeing this success, multiple teams would follow suit. The initial wave of teams that would follow suit would be teams such as the Philadelphia A's, who moved to Kansas City, the St. Louis Browns, who moved to Baltimore to become the Orioles, now one of the saddest teams in the league, the Brooklyn Dodgers, who moved all the way to Los Angeles, and the New York Giants, who moved out to San Francisco. After the move, the team would find success as they had the help of star hitter Hank Aaron to help. 1957 would prove to be one of the franchise's best years as Aaron won the NL MVP, they won the National League pennant, and eventually the World Series, beating the Yankees in seven games. In 1958, they would repeat as National League champs before blowing a 3-1 series lead in the World Series to the Yankees. In 1959, they tied with the Los Angeles Dodgers in record and ended up losing the championship playoff, ending their year. That season would be the last successful one in Milwaukee, as the period of 1960-65 would be one of decline in performance and attendance. While they never, never had a losing record in Milwaukee, it didn't mean the team was successful. Perini would end up selling the team in 1965 to a group led by William Bartholomew. The city of Atlanta, Georgia, who had desperately wanted a professional sports team, lured the team there by building the brand new Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. And so in 1966, the team moved and became the Atlanta Braves, later sharing the stadium with the Atlanta Falcons of the NFL. The late 60s proved okay for the Braves, who mustered decent records and ended up winning the NL West pennant in 1969, the year the MLB created the division as well as the divisional and championship series. While winning the NL West, they ended up getting swept in the NLCS by the New York Mets, who were called the Miracle Mets for their accomplishments that season. The 1970s wouldn't be very nice to the Atlanta Braves, though, as they only had two winning seasons in the entire decade. Brave fans were, though, delighted to see Hank Aaron break Babe Ruth's career home run record, though, in 1974. One ball and no strikes. Aaron waiting. The outfield deep and straight away. Fastball is a high drive into deep left center field. Buckner goes back to the fans. It is gone. After the fruitless 70s, the team was sold to Ted Turner, 
owner of WTBS, or TBS Now. He did this mainly in order to keep a stable programming on his channel, and why not do the team's baseball, the city's baseball team? His ownership, though, despite his original purpose, would be very important to the team. 1980 would be the, first, the team's first winning season since 1974, and they would end up making it to the 1982 NLCS, where they would be swept by the St. Louis Cardinals. The team would have many stars in the 80s, such as Phil Negro, who was a five-time Gold Glover for the Braves, and Dale Murphy, who was a two-time MVP for them. But they would only average about 65 wins a season throughout the back half of the decade. 1986 would also mark the year the team abandoned their Native American mascot. As the 90s came about, the team tooled itself for success with developing players such as Tom Glavin, who would win two all Cy Youngs for the team, John Smoltz, who would win a Cy Young for the team, and Chipper Jones, who would win the NL MVP and two Silver Slugger awards during his tenure. 1991 would prove amazing for the team, as they would end up beating the Pittsburgh Pirates in a seven-game NLCS, but they ended up losing in seven games to the Minnesota Twins in the World Series. Base hit loaded, one out. Infielders are sort of halfway at second and short. Pena in a jam. The Twins are going to win the World Series. The Twins have won it. It's a base hit. It's a 1-0, 10-inning victory. Nineteen ninety two would prove fruitful for the team as well, as they would beat the Pirates in a seven game NLCS again, before getting dominated by the Toronto Blue Jays, falling in six games. With a tying run at third and two down in the bottom of the eleventh, four three Blue Jays. John Swans the pinch runner at third. and bunts. Kimble on it. Throws to first. For the first time in history, the World Championship banner will fly north of the border. The Toronto Blue Jays are baseball's best in 1992. In 1993, they snagged the talented Cy Young winning pitcher Greg Maddox from the Chicago Cubs, successfully anchoring one of the league's most dominant pitching staffs in history. He would also win another three Cy Youngs for them, which were pretty, pretty important. They would end up winning 104 games that season, only to fall in the National League Championship Series in a six-game upset to the Philadelphia Phillies. The 1994 season would be an interesting one, as the league shifted them into the NL East, as well as the fact that strikes shortened the entire season. After the strike season, the Braves would power through 1995, pushing through the NLDS, where they beat the Colorado Rockies in four games, and NLCS, where they swept the Cincinnati Reds, before beating the Cleveland Indians in the World Series with their dominant pitching. 51,000 plus on their feet. Nobody's left to beat the traffic tonight, I guarantee you. Mark gets the sign. The wind and the pitch, here it is. Swung. Fly ball, deep left center, Grissom on the run! Yes! Yeah, yes! Yeah, yes! Yeah, yes! Yeah. The Atlanta Braves yeah. have given you a championship! Listen to this crowd! A mob scene on the field! Rollers gets up one, two, three! A couple of fans rushing on the field! And the Constables restrain them. The Atlanta Braves have brought the first championship to Atlanta. The Braves would make it to the Fall Classic again in 1996. However, they fell to the New York Yankees in six games. Another chance to the left side. Hayes waits. The Yankees are champions of baseball.
In 1997, the Braves left Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, which was a good thing since the multi-purpose nature of it made it have an awkward atmosphere for both football and baseball, and they would move into Turner Field, named after their current owner. The Braves would make it back into the World Series in 1999, but this time they would be swept by the Yankees. The crowd standing. Cameras flashing, and Rivera cool as a cucumber. The 1 0. Swung on, hit in the air to left center. Bernie trots over. Curtis is there. Curtis makes the catch. Ball game over. World Series over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. The New York Yankees for the second straight year, for the third time in the last four years. In 2000, the Braves make it to the NLDS before they were swept by the St. Louis Cardinals. In 2001, the Braves make it all the way to the NLCS before they fell in five games to the eventual world champion Arizona Diamondbacks. In 2002, they fell in five games during the NLDS to the San Francisco Giants. In 2003, they fell yet again in the NLDS in five games, this time to the Chicago Cubs. Then in 2004 and 2005, they made it to the NLDS, where they fell to the Astros of Houston both times, five games in 2004 and four games in 2005. In 2006, the Braves would miss the playoffs for the first time in 11 years, before they were sold to Liberty Media in February of 2007. In 2007 and through 2009, the Braves ended up just being mediocre, unable to do much after losing their mojo, essentially. In 2010, the Braves made it back to the playoffs, this time though losing in the NLDS to the Giants in four games. 2011 would be silent as they missed the playoffs, and in 2012 they would end up falling to the St. Louis Cardinals in the wild card game. The next year in 2013, the Braves would end up falling to the Los Angeles Dodgers in a four game NLDS. 2014 through 2017 would be silent for the Braves as they wouldn't make the playoffs during those years, and in 2017 they would move into brand new SunTrust Park, which was a little bit weird considering how Turner Field was only 20 years old at that time. 2018 would be a good year for the Braves though, as they had the new talent of young icon Ronald Acuna Jr., who won the Rookie of the Year for them that year. And that year, they ended up going to the NLDS to face off against the Dodgers, where they lost in four games. Again. In 2019, the Braves made it all the way to the NLDS, where they faced off against the St. Louis Cardinals, where they competed for four games and didn't compete for an extra inning. He knows he is going to have a massive lead with which to work. Ozuna strikes out. McCann's got to chase it down. He falls down. He can't make the throw. And Ozuna's going to be safe. Another run's going to score as the Braves cannot secure the strikeout. It is 10 to nothing, St. Louis. In the first. <laughs> and now we make it to the end of the Braves history. The 2019 season is behind us. And now all the team can do is look forward to the 2020 season as they can hope to rebound from their crushing losses in their past. The Braves' history has been marked with a lot of ups and downs, but looking how it's going with the young talent they're building up, such as Ronald Cunha Jr. or and Freddie Freeman, it should be another year, a couple good years, that the Braves should be able to compete once again. Thank you guys for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. See you guys in the next episode.